Greetings, Jay Stone here, Cap and Ball Fanatic channel. Welcome back to the channel, or welcome in if this is your first time finding us. So in today's video, we're going to look at three major challenges that every new Cap and Ball shooter has to overcome and come to grips with if they're going to find themselves involved in this hobby for a long period of time. And if you stick around till the end, we'll give you several ways to overcome and beat these challenges so you too can become a cap and ball fanatic. Stay with us. Okay, let's get to major challenge number one. And that is what I call the slow, deliberate, and focused loading process. And that's exactly what it is. This is nothing like loading your modern firearms. This is nothing like that at all. And you've got a lot of choices, and I'm going to go over some of them. Now, I want to be clear before I get into this. I'm not going to get into great detail here, because not too long ago, I did a full-length video on the loading, cap and ball revolver loading process. And I'll put the link to that video in the, in the, in the show notes. But what I want to talk about is just this process. I have seen new shooters, friends of mine, who come out to try cap, they want to try cap and ball revolvers. They've read about them, they've seen about them, they watched them on YouTube. They, they've really into it. They came over to my range. They started to learn how to load, got through it about two times. It took them about 15 minutes to load chambers of six and get them capped each, right? Because it's awkward at first. They didn't know what they were doing. They felt like they had five thumbs on both hands. But I saw them sort of, their enthusiasm sort of wilt because they didn't have the patience or they weren't willing to give the patience to actually learn how to do this. So let's, let's go through this right now. Again, remember, it's not modern. You're not buying a box of shells. You're not loading up some magazines with an auto loader. You're not slamming them in the gun and firing down range. That's fun. I do that. But that's not what we're here. That's not what this is all about. Also expect that whether you're going to be loading loose powder and round balls or making paper cartridges or whatever you're going to be doing, it's going to feel awkward at first. It's going to be confusing. And let me tell you about the process here. When I first started, it might take me 10 minutes to load a, a cylinder full, whether that's five or six, because I'm being very deliberate. Now I can load a cylinder full of six and cap it in about two minutes. So it's just like anything else in life. If you want to do it bad enough and you're willing to put in the time and have the patience and focus, it becomes easier to do. Right? But let me talk about, think of all the choices that we have here, right? On this table is everything you need to load and shoot your cap and ball revolver. But as I said, we have choices. At the top left are three examples of real black powder, 3FG, and Pirate XP, a 3FG powder substitute. Then you have choices of what you're going to use with your powder. Are you going to use round balls and wads over powder, conical bullets over loose powder, or combustible paper cartridges? On the top right are percussion cap choices, although these are hard to find these days, so our choices are limited. It's a, it, there's a lot to it, right? There's a lot to make choices. And what I like about it is I can change my powder loads chamber to chamber to chamber or cylinder to cylinder so I can play around and see what powder load gives me the best accuracy, the best recoil. Um, uh, I, can, I can up my powder load if I'm shooting at distance. I can lower it if I'm shooting closer. I mean, you really get a chance to, to uh, put your fingerprints on each and every shot that you take. So let's talk about challenge number two what I call shooting your cap and ball revolver, dealing with choices and disruptions. Yep, you heard it, disruptions. So what I'm going to show you now is, a, is, is some clips of what this whole thing is supposed to look like when it comes together. So you can see from a process perspective, everything loaded was right. Everything was capped right. All the caps worked all the time. 
And that was a lot of fun. And I'm sure you've had a lot of fun with yours too. Um, but one of the things that we need to get pre prepare new shooters for, just like with the loading process we talked about earlier, are some of the choices and some of the things that happen along the way that are different from shooting modern firearms, including modern revolvers. Number one is obviously different from some of your modern semi-autos with uh, larger magazines. You only get five or six shots, depending upon how you choose to load. And then you're back to the loading table, right? So you get five or six shots and you're back to the loading table, which for some people becomes a burden. And that's what we're trying to overcome here. As my loading acumen has gotten better, the number of shots that I take in a shooting session, which for me is an hour and a half or so, uh, and I shoot most every day, back when I first got started and I was all thumbs trying to load my cap and ball revolvers and I was being really deliberate. And so, you know, a good hour, I would get off, uh, you know, 18 to 24 uh, reasonable shots in an hour, hour and a half, and, and, and uh, be real happy with that. But as I've learned to load, more more quickly and more efficiently. Now I can go out in an hour, hour and a half, and I can get off uh, somewhere between uh, 36 to 50 shots. Depends on if I'm in a bit of a rush, which I don't like to be. This cap and ball revolver hobby is not one that I like to rush through, and I don't encourage anybody else to rush through it. If you're going to do this, give yourself a little time so that you can go out and you can sort of enjoy the process. Do that. Now, this, the next thing is you'll see that in that video, I was shooting one-handed. If you watch all of my videos, I'm always shooting one-handed like they did back in the 19th century. I do that because, <laughs> to me, it's more historically correct. To me, that's growing up watching Westerns on, on TV and in the movies. That's how you shoot six shooters. So that's why I'm working at it. It's harder. It's a heck, a heck of a big challenge. Um, I've had to strengthen my right arm a bit so that I don't, so my gun doesn't shake all over the place. But that's a choice that I make. But let me tell you. Most people I know who shoot cap and ball revolvers religiously do most of their shooting two-handed, just like you do with a modern firearm. So don't worry about that. Shoot what's comfortable to you. Shoot what's, what, what makes you have the most fun, because in the end, hitting targets is what makes this a lot of fun, right? So we don't want to make it so hard that we can't hit anything, although that brings us to our next point that you have to deal with, and those are the uh, point different varying points of aim of these uh, modern replica cap and ball revolvers. Now, if you like to shoot Colts, which are my favorite because they're sort of iconic looking and they they sort of look like the old West, you have to know that most Colts, not all, but most Colts don't shoot where you aim them. They shoot to anywhere from two to a foot high. So you got to aim, learn to aim low. The Remington revolvers, they tend to shoot a little closer to the point of aim. Their sight system's a little better than the, than the old fangled Colt with it, where the, the back sight is in the hammer as the top of the hammer and the front side is a little post up in front. So you got two choices there too, right? A lot of folks, and there's nothing wrong with this, a lot of folks start doing surgery on their on their sights. They put in new sights, taller sights, um, um, uh, target shooting sights, every you know, so that they can aim it, so they can hit what they're aiming at directly. I like I, as, as you can probably tell, I like to shoot things the way they come out of the box. And plus I'm not very handy, so I, I don't want to screw my guns up. But I tend to try to figure out how to aim off, which is the way of figuring out your elevation, which is top to bottom, point of aim, and your windage, which is left to right, point of aim. And I spend most of my early time with my new revolvers trying to figure out where I have to aim in order to hit the target. But these are my ways in my own head and in my own heart of trying to be historically accurate to the time. Now, I'm sure back in the day they fixed their sights and doctored their guns and all that stuff. I've read it. I've seen it. I've heard it. I can imagine when their lives depended on it. Absolutely. But you do remember the old saying with Colts, right? Aim at their belt buckle, hit them in the chest. And that's sort of the things we have to learn as we shoot cap and ball revolvers. So when you come out, you point right down the barrel. You think you've got the sight in. You pull that trigger on a Colt and it hit misses the target high or it hits a foot and a half higher than what you're aiming at. It's not you, brother and sister. It's, it's you try, now being faced with the option of trying to figure out how to sight your gun in and where you have to aim left, right, up, down in order to hit the target that you're shooting at. Then we get into the disruption. And from my perspective, the biggest disruptions to shooting has to do with percussion caps. Either percussion caps that blow off and blow back. Oops. So we lost the cap, 
Blowback, percussion caps that don't go off. Percussion caps that go off and go fizz in the nipples plug. Hold the gun out there when you get one of those. The nipple must be plugged. Um, cap jams uh, that fall down in the action of the revolver. Ah. As you can see, everything about cap and ball revolver shooting is a bit of a process, different from what we're used to. And I think this can get under the, under the, uh, on the last nerve of some new shooters if, they're, if, if we're not there to explain it. And that's why I'm doing this is because I want you to sort of know what you're getting into before you get there so that you can accept it, deal with it, uh, if it's something that you want to deal with and not have it become something that drives you away. Because I do think these are the kinds of things that drive people away. But when it all works, when it's all done, you're never going to find any more fun than shooting these cap and ball old 19th century uh, reproductions of 19th century six shooters downrange and seeing holes go in your paper target or, or hearing that steel go ring. All right, let's talk about major challenge number three. That is cleaning your cap and ball revolvers every time you shoot. Um, this is not a tutorial on how to clean your cap and ball revolvers. And what I want to talk about more is the issue of cleaning, which I think in the end is one of the biggest barriers for new shooters to overcome when they think about getting deeply involved with cap and ball revolvers, right? So what I wanna do here is I wanna talk about the notion of cleaning, why we have to clean fairly regularly, and I'll talk about the process that I use. Um, um, not, uh, again, not specifics to cleaning, but the process I use to determine whether I'm gonna do a simple cleaning that takes me about 30 minutes after I have a, a session at the range, or whether I'm it's time for me to do a deep cleaning which is gonna take an hour, hour and a half, and that's deep cleaning is when you tear the whole thing apart. So why do we have to clean these things every day? Well, as I've said before, black powder is dirty. Black powder is filthy. It gets into everything. It gets down in the grip frame. It gets, it's everywhere. And the other thing about black powder is, is that it attracts moisture. So if you shoot and you leave it set, and you leave it set in, 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 uh, for a long period of time, or even a relatively short period of time, I'm talking a week or so, maybe a little longer, without cleaning it up, without lubing it up, without using some rust preventers, without making sure your nipples are still going out, this stuff will start to develop rust real fast and your guns will rust. And while if surface rust, you can, you know, with steel wool and some other things, you can figure out a way to get that off. But if you leave them for too long and you forget about them, which is easy to do, especially if you're used to shooting modern firearms, then what you're into is uh, guns that rust up that might might be ruined and then they aren't gonna run for you. So because it's black powder is corrosive, because it attracts moisture, we have to clean these guns every time. Now, let me be clear. I don't clean them the minute I'm done shooting. If I go out today and I'm gonna put 40 or 50 rounds through, a, through a, one of my cap and ball revolvers and I'm doing it to, early in the day, I'm gonna leave it till tonight. I might even leave it till tomorrow before I have time to clean them up. Um, but nonetheless, I'm not going to put them away in the cabinet and forget about them. I'm going to clean them. And because I have so many of them, like some of you do, I'm a, sort of addicted to these things. I have to keep a, a spreadsheet on which ones I've shot, which ones I've cleaned, when the last time I tore them down to the studs and deep cleaned them was. Um, but I have two methods of cleaning. My simple cleaning that I mentioned earlier is typically, all things being equal, when I put, say, between 30 and 70 shots, maybe 75 through one of my revolvers, then I will do a simple cleaning, which as I said, just involves cleaning the inside of the barrel, all everything I can see down in the action, cleaning off the uh, hammer face, focusing mostly on the cylinder and the nipples. I always take the nipples out, clean them, <clears throat> and, uh, and uh, uh, lube it all up and put it away. Why don't I deep clean it every time? Because I'm likely to use that revolver again fairly soon. When I deep clean, all things being equal, is more than 75 shots. And then I'll take the, it takes me about an hour and a half, then I'll take the uh, revolver apart um, and clean every single part, clean it all up, dry it off, lube it up really, really good, put it back together, um, and then put it away. But I don't think 
again, all things being equal, and I'll explain that in a second, I don't think you have to worry about, about uh, deep cleaning every single time, unless there are some considerations to this. One, if you live or shoot in a very humid area, um, Michigan here, where I am, I, you'd think it's not that humid, but Lake Michigan isn't too far away from me, and we are almost tropical humid sometimes through the summer. So when it's really humid, you'll find that your guns get dirtier faster, and it sticks and it cakes. Um, and uh, I will uh, then I will clean them, deep clean them more frequently um, uh, uh, because of that. If you live in a dry area, you probably don't have to worry about it as much. Second is if I decide not to shoot with uh, lube wads or any grease over the cylinders. That's going to make them dirtier, so I will clean them more diligently. Second, the, the other time, I, as I mentioned a little earlier, I always clean it more deeply is when I'm putting them away. If I know I'm not going to use it for a while, then I start worrying about rust over time. Insides of gun cabinets, the insides of gun safes tend to be really humid. So you ought to have, a, if you don't have a dehumidifier, a little machiney thing in there, then I would worry about making sure that you don't put them away with too much black powder down in the action because you might take them out in three months and find that they've started to develop some pretty significant rust. So that's sort of my deep cleaning philosophy, right? Why do I clean regularly? Because I love my revolvers and I want them to keep working for a long, long time, right? It takes a little extra time, but I just see it as part of the process that starts with figuring out which one I'm gonna shoot, going through the loading process, doing all the shooting, and then I'm not done, in my mind, I'm not done with that shooting session until that revolver gets cleaned. I mark it on my sheet so I know that I've cleaned it and I put it away. It's just part of the process. And I hope that you too can come to see it as just part of the process and not allow a half an hour for a simple cleaning or an hour and a half for a deep cleaning, whether it's the later that day or the next day, I would hate to see something like the need to maintain your guns, the need to clean your revolvers, be a reason why you don't want to shoot. And let's not forget, when we talk about cleaning, we think it's a problem to put a half an hour in when we shoot our guns every couple, three days. Think back to the 19th century and during the Civil War. There's a lot of first-person accounts in history that talks about Civil, Civil War combatants, uh, people on the frontier, spending most of their downtime when they weren't eating or sleeping, cleaning their guns because they know that black powder is corrosive. They know that if you don't keep them clean, they aren't gonna operate smooth. And what is it the wild Bill Hickok says when he was asked why he cleaned and reloaded his, his 1851 navies every single day? He said, because his life depended on it, he said, when I pull, I must be sure. Hey, back at the beginning of this video, I said, if you stuck around long enough, and if you're watching me right now, that means you, you stuck it out, that I would give you a few ideas on how to overcome and accept these challenges and how to turn them into something that, that, that like for me and so many other people I know who are cap and ball revolver uh, um, uh, addicts, for a lack of a better word, or lovers, um, they have managed to make these challenges all part of the fun. And I know that might sound weird to brand new people involved, but it actually is part of the fun. So I've got a list of about five or six things that you can do and think about uh, and try that will help you sort of navigate your way through the early days of your cap and ball revolver fandom to see if you can't find your way into something that becomes a long-term source of satisfaction and fun um, and enjoyment. Okay, the first one is, and I've talked about it earlier in the video, and I say this in almost every video I work in, cap and ball revolver shooting, black powder shooting is a hobby of patience. There's no rushing here. There can't be any rushing here. I mean, we are, we are now stepping out of the modern times of a race where everything seems like it's a race and everything seems like it's, we got to get it done, we got to get it done, we got to get it done, time is money. And all that nonsense that, that drives some of us or so many of us to strokes and heart attacks, we're stepping back when you pull out your cap and ball revolvers into the 19th century, where things were different. There was a different pace to life. There was different sources to, you know, we didn't worry about clocks and times and days as much. It wasn't about getting to a meeting or getting here or getting there, or your phone's going off and all this stuff that goes on. It's a hobby of patience. And you know what? It's good for our health. It's been perfect for me. Because I, in my back when I was younger in my career, I was a pretty hard driving guy. 
professionally. And what I have found is, is that as I found my way into this black powder world, especially the cap and ball revolvers, because I enjoy them so much, that it has calmed me down. It has settled me down. When I go into this now, when I take my, put my gun belt on, take my gun out of the, out of the cabinet, and I gather my supplies and head to the shooting shack, I know that that's going to take me a couple hours. And if it takes me all day, you know what? The people around me know it takes me all day because I'm going to go out and enjoy myself and I'm going to apply a lot of patience. And some of the people that I have found that think they want to get into it, that are used to just sort of the modern way of firearms, they have a real hard time finding those patients. And that leads us to number two, check your expectations when you arrive to the cap and ball revolver shooting scene. As we have said over and over again, so many people I know, and I've struggled with it early on, they have expectations derived from years of shooting, loading and shooting modern firearms. And as I've said, and will continue to say to anybody who wants to hear it, this shooting has literally nothing to do with our experiences shooting, loading and shooting modern firearms. This is its own sort of thing. And so we have to look at them as parts of the process. You know, this is a different deal. Give yourself permission to suspend your expectations about what you're used to and develop a whole new set of expectations around your black powder cap and ball revolver shoot. If you do, you'll thank me. Third thing, and this is hard for some of us, especially us males in the room. It's hard for me. It's hard for a lot of us. It's okay to ask people who know more than you do for help. It doesn't mean you're stupid. It doesn't mean you're weak. It doesn't mean you know. I don't care if you've been shooting modern firearms for 75 years. This is different. It's okay to seek mentors, whether they're in person, local gun clubs, or on YouTube channels. There's some great YouTube channels out there, three or four of them, five of them, that I really highly recommend. In addition to mine, of course, I recommend mine. But there's people that, that, that know a lot more than me that go into things that I'm not going to go into. Um, and so it's okay to seek a mentor. I have mentors for things in my life. Some of them are older than me. And you know what? If somebody knows more than me, I don't care if they're 25. I'm going to seek out the mentor who can give me what I'm looking for, and I'm going to do it and not be embarrassed by the fact that I don't know it. Somebody told me once in, in my other profession, there's no such thing as a dumb question. The only dumb question I've ever heard from students and other people in my life are the questions that don't get asked, and then it sets them behind the eight ball. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Four, practice, practice, practice. That goes without saying. The more you do, everything's going to be awkward at the beginning. You're going to, your, your accuracy is going to be off, especially if you're shooting one-handed. Your accuracy is going to be off if you shoot two-handed until you figure out your points of aim. It's going to get better. Trust me. Practice. Put in some time. Think about what you want to do and, and, and allow yourself the opportunity to fail first so that you can succeed later. This is a big one to me, number five, and that's you have to have an appreciation for the history of these firearms and I think the 19th century. Now, I'm not talking about being always historically accurate. I'm not talking about the notion that, that some folks come on uh, the face tube and act like they're the history police. I'm not talking about that kind of dedication to the history, although it's kind of fun to do it, um, but there's a time and a place, right? I'm talking about an appreciation of the times of the, of the fact that these revolvers that we think are so rudimentary and are so different from our modern firearms that 150 years ago, these were the pinnacle of firearms technology. And don't get it wrong, cap and ball revolvers didn't go away when cartridges and conversion cylinders were made because these are things people were familiar with because distribution channels out west and across the country weren't like they are today. Just because they were available doesn't mean people could get them and incomes were so low. People used cap and ball revolvers on the regular all the way into the early 20th century. So these aren't things that just evaporated in the 1870s. Maybe we could all learn a little something from knocking off a little bit of the pace of our lives and, and going back to some of the, the, the slower pace of the 19th century. It might let people like me live a little bit longer and at least a little bit happier. And then the last one, truly, I mean this, relax and have fun. Just have a blast. Just get into it for the experience. Don't put any pressure on yourself. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're shooting 
eight out of ten on on the bullseye. None of that really matters. If you want to get good enough with these things to go to competitions, then you can worry about it a little bit if you want. I do shoot competitions, but I, I don't care if I win. I'm out there to have fun, and if I happen to get a a prize or a beat or a, my name at the top or near the top of the list, that just gives me reason to talk trash to some of my friends. I don't really care. I'm not going to the Olympics. This isn't life and death like it was in the 19th century. This is fun. So relax and have fun. And with that, I hope you enjoyed this video. A little bit different kind of video than what I'm used to making. I know there's a lot in here for new shooters, but you know, as an old time shooter, I like to go back and watch the videos I watched when I first got started and really rethink sometimes what I'm doing here because it's easy to get off track. So even for, even for veteran shooters, I hope there's something in here for you. If you enjoyed this video, if you found any value in this video, help us out here on the Cap and Ball Fanatic channel and give us a thumbs up. That really helps us a lot. Uh, share our videos, if you feel, with your friends on social media and, and, and invite them to come in. If you're not a subscriber now, please consider subscribing. Help us build our Cap and Ball Fanatic community here. So, again, I'm Jay Stone. I'm the host of the Cap and Ball Fanatic channel. I hope you enjoyed it. I had fun making this video, but now I'm ready to go back out to the range for real. And we'll see you again on down the road the next time.